Thank the Lord. All right. Uh, we, uh, we welcome you all here this morning as we look into God's Word. I thank God for His Word spoken to us. Uh, Brother Leo shared a little bit, and Sister Donna shared some, and I didn't tell anybody, I didn't talk to anybody about what I was going to speak on, but I feel it, it's just a confirmation what the Lord has given for us this morning in His Word. We welcome you all. We welcome our, our new friends here, some new faces here this morning. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, but the most important one being here is the Holy Spirit. That's my, if he doesn't show up, ain't, no, it doesn't matter who's here. But I thank God that he shows up. I'm going to read a little bit this morning from the book of Hebrews, uh, the letter to the Hebrew Christians. And we're going to begin in, in chapter 8. Before we do, I, I just a little introduction. Like uh, we, we right now are living, the time we're living in this, uh, this September, we're like in between two Jewish feast days. And uh, I, I love Hebrew things. I, I love to study the Old Testament. I love to study the types and shadows that are in the Old Testament that point to Christ. Um, and I, I have a, I, I just, I, I enjoy seeing God at work, even before the cross, even before the full revelation of the of the truth of the promise. Uh, he all through from Genesis to Malachi. In, in the entire Old Testament, God has shown us his, uh, his plan. And we can see it more clearly now as we look back upon it, because we, we see the fulfillment of it. But the folks in the Old Testament had to believe what God said. They were saved by faith. They weren't saved by the law. They were saved by faith. If, if it was possible to be saved by the law, we wouldn't have needed Christ on the cross. So... Uh, I, I, love, I love that, and I love, I love learning about the, the, the Jewish sacrifices and the Jewish feast days, because all those things that happened pointed toward Christ. They were all a picture from the very first promise in the book of Genesis when God told Eve, uh, or, or God told us, Satan, uh, the, the, the seed of the woman would bruise his head. And he would bruise his heel. All the way through to the end of Malachi, which says the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. It's all pointed toward the promise of the coming Messiah. Not just for the nation Israel, but for all of mankind. Uh, last week, uh, the, on, on the Jewish calendar, was the Feast of Trumpets. It was the beginning of their, their fall uh, feast days. We know that the, we've talked about this before. There's, a, there's a, a cycle of spring feasts that uh, is Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits. Then there's the day of Pentecost. Those feast days were prophetic, and they were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. When he uh, was died was, and buried and risen again on the third day, and then on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given, those were the fulfillment of those, those uh, particular feast days. There are three more feast days at the, in the autumn time, and that's the time we're in right now, the, the Feast of Trumpets, the blowing of trumpets, an awakening blast, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, uh, and then the final one is the Feast of uh, uh, Tabernacles. And they would do this every year. They would go through these. They were commanded by God every year to celebrate these feasts. Now listen, salvation was not in the celebration of the feast. The, cel- the, the uh, salvation was in... Trust in God. Because King David said, offerings and sacrifices I would not have, but a broken heart and a contrite spirit. These are the true sacrifices of God. So the salvation in the Old Testament is the same as it is in the New. We just know we have a greater revelation than they had. But we're living in this time now of, we're right in between, I believe, the 23rd, the 22nd and 23rd, from sundown on the 22nd, is the Day of Atonement. And we're going to read about that in a little bit, what the Day of Atonement was. Leo spoke about going into the Holy of Holies, right? That's what the Day of Atonement was all about. Uh, This last week was the Feast of Trumpets. And the 10 days in between Trumpets and uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is called the Days of Awe, A-W-E. And those are, those are the time when the, the, the Hebrews would, would examine themselves. And it was a time of repentance and a time of fasting. And Yom Kippur was a solemn feast day. It was a time of, uh, time of fasting. And it's when the high priest would go in and make an offering for the people. And I have found, uh, you know, lately in the time that we're living in, there have been a lot of people who have talked a lot about the blood moons. How many people have heard of blood moons? Or the lunar eclipses happening on 
Jewish feast days, and uh, the, the, you might have turned, heard the term Shemitah, which is a, a jubilee year, and so forth. And a lot of people have uh, uh, made a lot of this, and I think you know, they're talking about signs. I think a lot of folks talking about this are seeing dollar signs because they're writing books and making DVDs and tapes. And I'm not, I'm not dismissing that, you know. Uh, they say a shaking is coming. Well, I don't think you have to be a prophet to understand that. The way this country's going, there's judgment coming. When we have a Supreme Court that has tried to annul God's law, there's, there's judgment coming. It, 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 you don't have to have a, a sign in heaven for that. It's, uh, it's according to God's word. Uh, uh, but I found that a lot of folks are using these feast days. They'll use the feast days and they'll put the word offering after. You know, send your Yom Kippur offering to me. Send your uh, Passover offering to me. And it's, it's become these things that are so precious and so beautiful in, in God's word have become like a way for some folks to make money. But that's, you know, whatever. It is what it is. The thing is, God's going to do what he's going to do. If, if, I, if, 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 these, if these lunar eclipses have any meaning, if I know about it or don't know about it, God's going to do what he's going to do. He's going to send judgment on this earth. It's promised in the Word. So we focus on that. Okay, now I, I said all that. It's kind of like a little introduction uh, because I want to talk this, this morning, and I was really uh, thankful that you know, uh, Leo shared what was on his heart because it's talking about going into the holy place in Hebrews. This letter was written to the, the Jewish Christians. We all know that the, all the first Christians were all Hebrew. They were all Jews. And, uh, and they, for about the, the first 15 years... That's all it was. These were Jews that were living. They're, they were celebrating their Judaism. Uh, they practiced Judaism, they, the, the feast days, the sacrifices, and so forth. Uh, but they owned Jesus as their Messiah. They realized that he was the Messiah of Israel. And everything went along there for 15 or 20 years until something started happening. This word of grace, the gospel, started going out to people who weren't Jews. In Acts chapter 10, we read about Peter going to the house of Cornelius, who was a Roman soldier. And, uh, you know, Peter, uh, he, would, he would never have set foot in the house of a Roman soldier. God had to give him a vision. He had to prepare him. And when, 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 when Peter went to see Cornelius, he said, you know, before I would not even have walked into your house, but, but God appeared to me in a, in a vision. And he went in and he preached and the spirit fell. And Cornelius and his household got saved. They weren't circumcised. They weren't Jews. They, didn't, they weren't kosher. They were none of that. But they received just what, what the, the, the Jews had received on the day of Pentecost. So Peter said, well, we might as well baptize them. <laughs> if God baptized them already, we might as well do it too. Who are we to say we ain't going to baptize them? So that, that's, that caused a big stir. Because when, when, when the folks back in Jerusalem found out that Gentiles were getting saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, they said, wait a minute. You, wait, did, they, did, they get, did they get circumcised? Did they uh, proselytize in their Judaism? And they had a big con uh, uh, a council about it. Acts chapter 15, you can read about there. There was, there was, a, lot, there was a big debate. Should we let these uncircumcised Gentiles be part of... I mean, he's the Messiah. He's the Jewish Messiah. He came to Jerusalem. He didn't go to them. But it was determined that the word of grace that they preached was not just for the Jew. Thank God, because I'm not a Jew. Thank God that it was for everybody, for all whosoever will put their faith in Jesus Christ will not be ashamed. Amen. Thank God for it. Okay, but it caused a problem with the early, and these, these, these early Christians who were Jews, they began to fade away as the Gentiles began to, the, the, the church began to become a Gentile-dominated organization or institution. The, the, a lot of the Jews wanted to go back to their Judaism. They wanted to go back to, to all the stuff they did and all the, all the, all the kosher laws that they followed. They, they just couldn't deal with the fact that somebody could be saved without going through all what they, I mean, they were raised. How many of you were raised in church? You know, I was raised in the church, and we had a pound in our head what you had to do, and this and that, and, you know, we had, like, holy days of obligation, right? Yeah, you got to go to church. And, and, and as a kid, I was like, well, well, you know, why do I got to do this? And they, they would, you know, they put all these things on you they had to do, right? And it got to be like, see, when it, when it turns from, when it turns to that, when it turns to a, a bunch of regulations, it goes from being faith to, to being religion, okay? Now, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's read a little bit. I better start reading or I'm going to get myself in trouble. All right. 
We'll read from God's Word. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7. The author here is trying, he's, he's, he wants to convince the readers that they don't, they don't need, they don't want to go back. See, there's folks today, and like I said, I love Hebrew stuff. We've had Passover demonstrations. That's, you know, to, to, you know Jesus in the Passover. We've, we've had things like that. We've taught on the feast days. But you know what? See, I don't, you know what? I celebrate the Passover every day. I, listen to what he says. And we're kind of jumping in the middle of a thing here, but I don't want to read the whole book. Uh, For if that first covenant, meaning the covenant of the law, okay, if it had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. If you could be saved by keeping the law of Moses, why did Jesus have to die? For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. They couldn't keep that first covenant, so I had to make a new one. So when Jesus, whenever we have communion, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant written in my blood. See, it was new. It's, 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 it's not the old one. The old one couldn't save them. This is what he says in uh, uh, verse uh, 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. He's saying, there's going to come a time when my spirit's going to be in you in in a new and special way. Joel said that, uh, uh, Peter quoted from Joel, said the young men shall dream dreams and old men shall see visions. Their, 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 their maidens will prophesy. When the Spirit of God gets poured out. He says, looking at verse 13, in that he said, a new covenant, he that made the first, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. He said, listen, the old covenant, it wasn't bad, but it's, it's, we don't need it anymore. Now listen to what he says in, in chapter 9 now. In chapter 9. I'm just going to read a little bit this morning. not going to keep it too long. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in the worldly sanctuary. There were, there were rules for the priests. They had a tabernacle. There was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. I, I may be sure to put a picture up of this, but some of you, most of you might be familiar with the tabernacle in the wilderness. And then later, the, the, the temple that was built in Jerusalem, Solomon built a temple. It was destroyed. Then the Jews built another temple, and then Herod had built a temple, which was a temple that was there when Jesus was there. And we know that in, in that tabernacle, there was an outer court. There was a, there was a surrounding uh, fence made of, of, of skins, and there was an outer court. That's where the brazen uh, uh, altar was, and that's where the, the laver was, and uh, that's where they would bring the animals to make sacrifice. But then there was a tent called the Tent of Meeting that was inside that enclosure. And in that tent, it had two, it had two uh, uh, rooms, as it were. The the first room was where the priests would go in, and that's where they had the menorah, and they had the, they had the table of showbread and all these things, and they had the altar of incense, and they would go in there, and they would minister in there every day. But the second part, there was a veil, a big, thick veil that hung uh, between the first part and the second part, and in that second part was the Ark of the Covenant. In that ark, he goes on to describe this, in that ark was, a, was a, the Ten Commandments, the pot of manna, and Aaron's rod, and so forth. But nobody went in that second part, except once a year, when the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement, which is coming up 22nd, 23rd of this month, okay? Let's read, read on here a little bit. Verse, uh, verse 3 of chapter 9. Verse 4 of chapter 9. Uh, uh, verse 3. And after the second veil, after the, the veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak now. 
Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. They would go into the first part and do what they had to do. But unto the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. Because if he would have went in there without blood, he would not have walked out. He had to crawl underneath that veil. It didn't have an opening in it. There wasn't a door. He had to crawl underneath that veil. He had blood on the Day of Atonement. What they would do is they would take two goats. They would offer one and take the blood. And the other one they would send out. He would confess the sins of the people and send them out into the wilderness. That was called the scapegoat. Okay, that's where we get that term, scapegoat. But he would go in there with blood. He said, uh, verse 7, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. We don't have any errors, okay, in here, right? They had errors. If you read about the Jews, they had a lot of errors. They were stiff-necked and stubborn people. Not unlike, well, no, not us. Some, Some other place. The Holy Ghost, thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Here's what he's saying. He's saying this was just a picture of the way things are in heaven. That tabernacle was a picture. That holy place was a picture of the real holy place. It was just a, just a form. It just, it, it just refers to something else. And it said here that they could bring all these offerings and sacrifices, but none of them could change a person on the inside. None of them could change a person on the inside. It was just a a covering. It was temporary. It was something looking forward to something else. But they could not do the work that we all need done sometimes. The cleansing of our conscience. What he's describing here, they would practice the the, the Jewish religion. But if their heart wasn't right with God, they were just going through the motions. And doing all this stuff, offering all these. He's writing this to people that were thinking about going back to that. That's why he says later on, he says, listen, if Jesus' sacrifice isn't enough, there's not enough. If his blood couldn't cleanse you from your sin, there's nothing. There's nothing left. Listen to what he says. Verse 11. Oh, verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation or until the time that Christ would come. But Christ is not talking about the Protestant Reformation, okay? He's talking about Christ. But Christ being a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus, when he came here, he shed his blood, and when he went into the real holy place, not the one in the building in Jerusalem, but when he went to where his father was seated on the real mercy seat, he, he was the high priest, and he was the sacrifice. That's why Leo was saying, we ought to be jumping up and down and praising the Lord, because what I couldn't do, what religion couldn't do for me, Jesus did for me. Even when I hated him, before I was even born, the offer was there. Before I became a Christian, when I didn't even want to hear about God, I, all I wanted to do was live for myself and live for Satan. Even, even then, the offer was there. While we were dead in sins, yet he loved us. Amen. And he didn't take some animal and take the blood out. He took his own blood. He offered his own blood in the real holy place. And you know what happened when Jesus died? He, when he gave up the ghost, it says, Father, into thy, hands I com- into, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. You know what happened? The veil you know, in, 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 in the temple, they had a big veil, just like they did in the tabernacle, that separated the, the, the holiest place from the holy. The only thing in, in that temple, they didn't have an ark. <laughs> the ark wasn't there. They, they, I don't know what happened to it. But they had that big veil. God tore that thing from top to bottom. He grabbed hold of it, just like a piece of paper. I wonder, I, I, just, I just wonder, and I don't know this, I wonder if they tried to sew it back together. <laughs> we try to. We try to sew it back together. Because when with that veil was tore open, it, it goes on here and it says, you know what? We can go freely to the throne of grace. I don't have to go through any high priest. 
I don't have to drag a lamb along with me and, and kill it or a goat or whatever. We, we can go freely to the throne of grace and, and seek the Lord for whatever we need. Or if we're brokenhearted, if, if we're struggling, we can go there ourselves by the blood of Jesus. Because the thing was torn. People try to sew it back together. That's religion. They try to put a bunch of uh, 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 standards and put a bunch of demands on you. Well, you know, you have to... And I, I've said this before, the early church, it didn't take them long to, to get back into that. It's just, a, it's just 100 years or so. They had, were making people go through all these classes they get, could get, uh, before they could get baptized. They were, uh, when, when they'd have a meeting, all the big shots would sit up front, and, they, and, the, and, the, and the poor catechumens, they call them, <laughs> they were in the back. I mean, they, they, started, they started dividing between the, the haves and the have-nots, you know. That's not the way Jesus put it. He ripped that veil in, in two. That anybody could go in by the blood of Jesus. Anybody could go in. You could go in. It doesn't matter where you, whether you're living in a penthouse or living on the street. You can go in boldly, expecting him to hear and answer your prayers. You don't have to be afraid of him no more. If that high priest went in without blood, he wouldn't walk out. But if you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ... We've got to read on a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained... He only had to go on once. He didn't have to come back out. That high priest had to go in every year. David told him, every year he'd have to go in and bring the blood. Every year they have to go through the thing now, you know, and, 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 and uh, get the people covered for another year. Every year he had to do it. But not Jesus went in one time. He doesn't have to go in anymore. His was enough. For if the blood of bulls and goats uh, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? Listen, no religion can change you on the inside. Only Christ. Amen. Only the blood of Jesus. Not only is, does that blood save us, but he keeps us. He keeps us going. I preached here a couple uh, weeks ago about grace. There's imputed grace. There's imparted grace. I mean, I, you know, that grace not only saves us. We say, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That's grace. Save the wretch like me. Praise the Lord. But that same grace will make me the person God wants me to be. I can't depend on nothing else. You know, we depend on grace to save us, and we want to go out and buy a psychology book. <laughs> You know, if we're going to go out and buy a like yourself book, I used to call them like yourself books, you know. If you felt like you didn't like yourself, you go out and buy some book by some doctor somewhere and it, it tell you, you know, I like yourself. You know, I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay. Well, listen, the only thing that's going to make me okay is the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that's going to work for me. He says it. He says religion, he says religion, you know, all this other stuff, it, it, you, you, you might make you look good on the outside, but it can't change you on the inside. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, verse 15. We're going to just read a little bit. See, I see you got, I'm mixed up now. I bought a new clock for the back wall. But I, it won't fit where, where the other one fits too big. So I had to put it off to the side. So now every time I look, I look up there and say, I have to look over here. Okay. Now it's over limbs. Okay. <laughs> All right. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, a new covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. But look what's wrapped up in this thing. Like Leo said, we ought to be jumping and shouting. Not only do we have our sins forgiven, not only can we go boldly to the throne of grace and, and seek him in time of need, but man, I have an eternal inheritance. He says, for a testament, just read a little bit more. For a testament is a force after men are dead. You know, if you leave a will and testament, you can't cash it in until somebody dies. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. When, when, if you go back to the Old Testament when Moses got the Ten Commandments and got the, the, the covenant of the law, he took blood and he sprinkled it on everything, covered with blood. A blood covenant, because there's life in the blood. Amen. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, in verse 19, he took the blood of calves and, and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, sprinkled both the book and all the people, 
saying, This is the blood of the, of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels. There's blood over everything. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So this blood thing, it's important. But the blood of bulls and goats and rams, they're just temporary. When Jesus shed his blood, it's eternal. For Christ, listen, listen to this, verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. You know, that tabernacle, the temple, that was all just a pattern of what was really in heaven. So they took the blood of bulls and goats, but that stuff's not going to wash up there. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. I thank God that Jesus, he didn't, when he didn't enter into the, to the, to the, tabernacle, the temple that was there in Jerusalem at that time. There was no ark there. There was nothing that was empty. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not, not, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters in the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end, the world, he, uh, the, uh, world has he appeared to put away, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He was a lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. It's done. It's a gift that he offers every one of us. Not just salvation, but a new life here. A lot of folks think salvation, you know, you nod your head, say the prayer, yeah. Then you just go, go back and kick your feet up and wait for Jesus to come back. No. Some people think grace is a blank check. Well, I got, I got grace, man, I saved by amazing grace. I can just go out and I'll just, I'll just play the grace card. <laughs> I'll do whatever I feel like doing. I say, well, man, I'm, I'm under grace. There's people preaching that. There's people preaching you never have to repent of a sin. I don't know. I, maybe, maybe somebody in here isn't like me, but I find myself every once in a while, you, you might get mad at Pastor Carmen, but every once in a while I do things I shouldn't be doing. You know. I mean, I ain't robbing banks or nothing like that. But. <laughs> don't cut me off on the highway, boy. I'll be, you'll, see my, you'll see how religious I can be. <laughs> All right. Come on, you might as well say amen, right? If anybody in here is sinless, you can come up. <laughs> come in. I got a Bible, water, everything. It's, just, it's yours. <laughs> but I thank God that Jesus Christ went in once for all. And my Bible tells me if I sin, I don't want to. I'm not trying to say, oh man, well, we have to go out and sin. I ain't saying that. But if I sin, I got an advocate. Amen. My lawyer related to the judge. I got an advocate. He's seated at the right hand of the judge, as a matter of fact. And if I sin, it says, if I confess my sin to him, he's faithful and just, over in 1 John chapter 1, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from unrighteousness. That's something to shout about. Amen. Praise the Lord. There, there's so much here. I just read a little bit more. Verse 28 of chapter 9. For Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. Won't it be good when we get to the place where we're in his presence that we won't sin anymore? <laughs> for the law, I'm just going to read a little bit more. I could, I could read the whole, book, the, rest, the whole rest of the book, but I, we'll, we'll be... Uh, We'll be here for a while. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers perfect. You know, I, I can't figure out. I say, I love, I love Jewish stuff. I love Hebrew stuff. But there are people that want to go back to doing the... And the thing is, they can't because there's no temple. You can't have a Yom Kippur. You can't have a Day of Atonement because there's no holy place. It was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. They can't, you, we can't practice Judaism anymore. They want to do it here. So I love Jewish things. Believe me, I do. We've had Passover demonstration. Our good friend, Pastor John Pesark, a uh, uh, Jewish, and, but he's, he's, uh, he, he doesn't call himself a Messianic Jew. He says, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> he says, I'm a Christian. He says, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian. 
I'm not a Jewish Christian. I'm not a Gentile Christian. I'm a Christian. He says, in, in verse 2, and I hate to skip, for, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. They had to keep going back and back and back. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Religion can't save you. It can't save you. There's some people that practice their religion. They crawl around on their knees. They roll around. They, they, do, they do stuff. They, they, they pray for hours. There were, in the early church, there were the, 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 the monastic movement. They would go out in the middle of the desert, and they'd live there for years, and they wouldn't eat, and they wouldn't bathe, and they wouldn't just... And, they, and somehow God was supposed to say, man, I really like this guy. Religion can't save you. Hiding from society won't save you. You say, well, you know, I'm going to get rid of my TV. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to go live in a cave somewhere. The problem is in society. The problem is in you. <laughs> say, listen, th- th- I need this heart changed. If I get this heart changed, it doesn't matter what they put on TV. I won't watch it. It doesn't matter what I see on the news. It, 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 if my heart's changed, if I'm sold out to God, it doesn't matter what. If my conscience is clear. That's what the blood of Jesus wants to do. Change your conscience. Change you on the inside. So we can say with, with all uh, 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 truth, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Wherefore, when he comes into this world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou would not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to do thy will, O God. Jesus tore that veil when he died on the cross. He made a way for us to come in. I just want, I just want to just drop down a little bit here. Just listen. Look at verse 15. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost is a witness to us. For after that, he had said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. If our faith and trust is in Jesus Christ, there's nothing beyond that that we can do. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Do you, can, do you know you can go up to God? You can enter in. I say, you don't know where I've been. It doesn't matter. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. There's no sin that's unforgivable except for unbelief. (laughs) Just recently, the Pope said, well, we we should forgive women that had had an abortion. Oh, that was nice of him. That's not the unforgivable sin. There's, there's, there's nothing that God can't forgive. He says that we, having, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. We'll, we'll, it, will, it will end with this. Take this with you. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Who's your faith in today? I hope it's Jesus Christ. And let us consider one another to provoke each other to good works. Listen, I thank God that we can enter in by the blood of Jesus. That's our hope. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of faith that we preach. That's what we have to stand on. That's what we have to live on. It's not a denominational doctrine. It's what, it's what this word teaches us. If your Christianity is a once or twice a week thing, man, you need to get you need to get a you need to get it wound up. You need to get it lit up. People people play church. 
Some of you have been around a whole lot longer than me. You've seen it. I go to church. I go to church Sunday morning. I do my duty. Go to church. And then they don't care what they do the rest of the time. And, and the thing is, we live in a society where you can get anything you want. You can have any kind of sin, any kind of corruption, anything. It's, it's out there. You know, how many, how many people, some of you that have been around a little longer than me, would have ever thought you could go down to Pittsburgh and lay down a bunch of money and play slot machine? There was one time that was illegal. You know, the Manorinos had to put it in a cellar down on Fifth Avenue. That's where they had the stuff down here. They had to go. You had to know somebody and open up the door. You go downstairs. I remember that store down on Fifth Avenue, right? Okay. That's when, that's when they, now, you know, it's just like you go down, man. They give you free food. They got the buffet there. Well, let's just go have something to eat. And, and they have all this going on. And you can, you can throw your money down and say, well, you know, we're helping. You know, we're uh, giving tax relief. Yeah, right. When they start talking about tax reform, you better hold on to your pocketbook. When was the time? But can you remember? You, you wouldn't hear bad words in a movie. Now you can't go like, you know, three minutes without hearing the F-bomb about four times. Yeah, we'll, we'll, lay our, we'll lay our cash down. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to meddle now. I'm starting to get, somebody's going to get mad at me. We'll lay our cash down. We'll go see a movie. Full of this and full of that and full of sex and full of everything else. Well, I'm not talking. There's, some, there's, some, there's been some good Christian movies made lately. That God bless, thank God for the ones who are making, uh, you know, movies that are righteous. That's great. But, but how many people will put their money down to get their brains fried? We pay, we pay good money to destroy ourselves. When all we have to do is walk into the holy place. Is that real? Do you believe that? Sometimes I wonder how many people really believe that. Well, I got myself in enough trouble. <laughs> There's no high like the most high. That's right. <laughs> I'm so thankful I can go boldly to the throne of grace. I'm so thankful that I have access to the Father. Not because I've, I've, I've earned, I've, I've, I've reached a rank, or because uh, I've, I've received some kind of some anointing. No, no, because of what Jesus did on the cross. He did it for me. He did it for you. He did it for everybody who is willing to walk in. He, he offers, he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I want to be saved. I'm so thankful I'm saved. I'm so thankful, Lord, that my, my sins are forgiven. I'm so thankful that when I struggle, when I'm, when I'm kicking against the pricks, and when I'm just, I can come boldly, you'll take me in. You'll let me come in. And you'll cover me with your blood. And you'll hear my prayers. I can say like the psalmist, what, what, what should I fear? What can man do unto me if I belong to him? Amen. Praise the Lord. Just stand as we close our service. Thank you, Lord Jesus. George, could you come? And uh, we, just want, we just want to worship the Lord a little bit. We're going to dismiss. Give me a C chord there, George, okay, when you can plug in. For he is Lord, he is Lord, he has risen from the dead, and he is Lord, every knee has bowed, and every tongue confessed. That Jesus Christ is. Is he your Lord this morning? Is he your Lord this morning? I'm not asking, you know, somebody say, well, I remember I said a prayer about three years ago. And, ah, no, no, I mean, do you have a relationship with him this morning? A relationship where you can go boldly to the throne of grace? 
where you don't have to go uh, climb through, uh, jump through hoops and, and go through mazes and, and say, well, maybe I'll, I'll find him here or maybe I'll find him there. The Bible says he's right here. He's in your mouth and in your heart. The tabernacle, this is the tabernacle right now. We don't have to build a tabernacle with a, you know, a holy place and a holy place. It's right here. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. And when you do that and you mean it, that veil's open for you. You can walk in. You don't need, you don't need, a, you don't need a, a, a ticket from anybody. You don't need to pass any test. Just call on the name of Jesus. Can we, can we sing in D? Let's, let's sing that song. Great love of God. Jesus, his name, he only is my foundation. And on that cross, he bled and died, and he took my sorrows for he took them forever let's sing it one more time great love of God Jesus his name he only is my foundation and all that cross he bled and died and he took my sorrows forever we're going to sing one more time and close in prayer I want to tell you if you need prayer for anything when the service is over please come brother Jairus myself brother George and Leo's here my wife will be happy to pray with you but we're going to sing that song one more time and dismiss. Thank you all for being here this morning. May God bless you. Uh, make his face to shine upon you. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Grant you peace and be gracious unto you. My soul finds rest in God.